Okay, um, so last time we were talking a little bit about the, um, the War of Basus as illustrating the virtues of uh, Arab tribal existence. And um, I think in that, um, in that war, as I implied, uh, will come later in the history of uh, the, uh, at least the storyteller's view of the Kais versus Kal. Uh, split among Arab tribesmen, basically northern versus southern tribesmen, and uh, maybe uh, one poet's or storyteller's view of how this began over nothing, basically, a lark's nest. I probably would be willing to fight a war over a lark's nest myself, rather than some of the other things people fight about. I know that I fight down in the coastline there over the cutting down of the blue heron's nests. And I would probably be willing to take extremely harsh action were I free to do so uh, over people who are insensitive and uh, disturb the uh, birds who are so beautiful. Uh, so I can understand that. I don't think I fight over a lot of things people fight over. But something like that I, I, it speaks to me. But maybe it doesn't mean anything to you. Um, all right. Then I started moving on back into uh, some of this uh, pre-Islamic background in southern Arabia. And uh, these stories are told, that's why I gave you this, because Nicholson, these are taken from, uh, are, is one of the few writers that gives you the whole legend of Ma'arib and the Tupas. Uh, Ma'arib was what, if you remember? was the basically the big flourishing capital of the uh, what was called Saba back then and later probably there's no A here but anyway you can put it in there Ma'arib you can put the A in you can leave it out it's a breathing mark in there Ma'arib it still exists in uh, Yemen today it is a city and there are archaeological ruins there of the water uh, conservation system they had a dike uh, system and um, it's um, it has to do in the legends and the stories with the movement of southern tribes northward but really it has to do with the collapse of southern um, prosperity civilization culture the ability to keep up the the dikes um, we're some experiencing a similar thing here in America our inability to keep up the levees in uh, in the modern period and the collapse of um, whole societies uh, because of the uh, inability of the water conservation system to function properly and they don't even know if those people are going to be able to go back into Louisiana and New Orleans and those places and live in any normal way for the foreseeable future and the investment it takes is astronomical to do it properly and, uh, so it's not just ancient civilizations, it's ghost cities like we have today, which is uh, almost uh, what you get the picture of, a non-functioning American city. So, uh, and we're considered ourselves a modern uh, civilization, so in ancient times that would even be worse. And, and this gives way, uh, so we have the, the uh, breaking of the dike, symbolic of the uh, collapse of southern culture. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, then these tubas come in. Now, who they were, where they were, um, it isn't clear. But the tubas are not a musical instrument, but are the, are the leaders of southern Arabia in and around this time and thereafter. Tuba. Uh, I don't know why we use that expression. It's the, it's the native. Uh, Usage probably means local king, and uh, since it was used by them, one might as well use it. But um, we have material on page 17 about the tubas and some uh, some uh, myth mythological ones. Uh, someone called Dul Karnayan, who in the Quran seems to be a reflection of Alexander the Great, and so on. Until we finally get to the uh, story of uh, Assad, Assad Kamil, Assad Kamil, and uh, who was one of the early, uh, what's that, tubas, 
I think uh, this begins on the bottom of 18 and carries over into 19. Um, I write on the board, I, I, I kind of hold you responsible for it. Assad Khan. And uh, where would the accent be? Let me see, where, where is the accent? Let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, the first syllable, so it's, I'm saying it wrong. I'm saying Kamil. It's yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm saying it right. Come, come, not come here. Come, pasa, come. Yeah, I'm saying the accent helps you pronounce the uh, the, the word in the way uh, Arab in this original language would. And there's some story, old legend cycles associated with him. And uh, here's a poem associated with him and campaign he undertook, and apparently, supposedly he had a campaign in. Uh, in Persia, this would be around the 400s of the after Christ period. And on his way back from this campaign, this is the interesting material, he stops and he comes to a town called Medina. I've drawn new maps, so I won't draw another map. And um, he was very upset about a situation there because he learned that one of his sons, how many sons he had, I don't know, who had been in charge of administration there had been murdered in Medina. Now, Medina was not called Medina at that time. What does Medina mean in Arabic? Do you know? City. City, right. So basically it becomes the city of the province. Actually, it's Medina of... Uh, Unalwara, Medina, I'm not sure if I can spell it right, it's Medina, uh, I, think, I guess it's like that, Umina Unalwara, the city of lights, the city of lights, but it's the city where the prophet developed his understanding of Islam, and where the Islamic religion and community was ultimately considered to have been born. And therefore, it gets a special name, Medina, the city of really the prophet, or the city of lights, prophet bringing light perhaps into the world. I'm not sure where the light comes from. What was it called before that? Al-Yahweh. And see, this is stuff every Muslim knows. Every Muslim knows this, whether that Muslim comes from Nigeria or Indonesia. And uh, therefore, if we were teaching uh, American personnel, soldiers, and others to be uh, culturally sensitive, they would be taught this in their, uh, in their uh, orientation before they go out to these areas. And then uh, people would respect them a lot because of their knowledge of uh, local customs and so on. So just the fact that the soldier could say, oh, Medina, ya, ya, for it, a, a local person would be awestruck that <laughs> anybody would know this. So that just shows deep knowledge already of someone else's culture. Which is what my point is in this class, to give you those underpinnings to some extent. Okay, now, so he's coming back through Medina, and he's very upset, and now hey, this is really weird. In Medina are two Jewish rabbis, the translation here says, we can call them rabbis. What are Jewish rabbis doing in Medina in the 400s? Well, uh, your guess is as good as mine, except they've been there for quite a long time. And they've probably been there longer than the, many of the tribes have been there from the south because they probably came down in the wake of the Jewish wars against Rome when they fled Palestine and probably were refugees and went south. And that would be in the first, second century AD. But if you take the book of Job as an example in the Bible, which is a third or fourth century BC book, they already knew all the place names of Northern Arabia, and Job, as I told you, living in Northern Arabia.
Arabia and certain oases that are familiar in northern Arabia are mentioned in the book of Job, like Taima. He goes to the oasis of Taima. Taima is a city not far, it's an oasis not far from Yafra. So even in the fourth century BC, the Jews knew about northern Arabia and its uh, settled places and Jews or people perceived as being Jewish were living there. And of course, in the southern part, we have the Solomon story going all the way back to the 10 hundreds BC, 9, 10 hundreds BC. And Solomon is supposed to be involved with the queen of that area, the queen of Saba or Sheba, who later is considered to be an Ethiopian queen, but she was really a Southern Arabian queen. It had to do with the Red Sea trade that Solomon was involved in, even in the Bible picture. And Solomon was supposed to have offspring from her, whether that's a true or mythological story, I can't tell you. But the Ethiopians to this day, because Ethiopia was at some point conquered by the Southern Arabians and interacted culturally with them anyway, consider their dynasties to be offshoots of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon, which is actually where you get groups like the Rastafarians functioning even in the modern period. You've heard of the Rastafarians, I take it. They consider Haile Selassie, the last king of Ethiopia, their, I don't know what you'd call it, supernatural savior figure even though he died in a prison and killed by a military officer, probably. Because uh, he once visited Jamaica and, uh, and uh, it rained in a drought there and people were very impressed by a, a, a black African monarch who had come to Jamaica. And Haile Selassie's original name before he became Haile Selassie was Ras Tafar. Ras in Ethiopian meaning prince and his first name meaning Tafar. So he was called Ras Tafar, and the Rastafarians come from that. But they're dating themselves all the way back to Solomon and Sheba through Haile Selassie. Yeah. Well, you know, this is how legend uh, sweeps through the universe. Yeah. Maybe some truth somewhere online, it may not be. And I'm not here to evaluate the truth value, just to tell you, you know, what people think, not whether it's correct or not. If I can correct things, I will at times. Now, this Asad Kamil story, I would say the Jewish penetration of Southern Arabia is very early. And uh, Yemenite Jews, for instance, who came to Israel in 1947 and 48 in a big airlift after the Arab, his first Arab Israeli war, if you want to call it that, or confrontation, when life for them became untenable in Yemen, Southern Arabia. They had been there for certainly 2,000 years and had survived through the whole period of the Prophet and Islam as well. Yet if you see them, they look like the indigenous people there. So you say, oh, well, they are converts. Well, they could be converts. Uh, or uh, when people intermarry with indigenous uh, people, slowly the indigenous strain takes over because the original strain is, uh, is overwhelmed by the local intermarriage situation. So I don't know what the cause of it is. Only a DNA test would tell you all that. You would have to measure the DNA of the uh, Jewish Yemenites with the DNA of most of the local Yemenites, and then you'd see how much intermarriage occurred or whether there was a separate line or so on and so forth. They did that with a Nigerian tribe recently that was claiming descent from the Jewish high priests and lo and behold, they found there is a marker for the priest line in Judaism in DNA, a strange marker that only exists in this priest line genealogy. And lo and behold, they found the marker in this, in this tribe in Nigeria someplace that was claiming this. So, uh, you know, the, these things do happen, even though the tribe looked totally Afro in every way, shape, or form. It had the DNA priest line marker from Palestine. Uh, and, and you'd have, I mean, I think DNA tests are really great in helping, you know, sort out, you know, prehistory. And the more people do this, to my mind, the better it is in terms of our understanding of who people are, where they came from, who they are, what they were. So I hope they do more and more of these things for all peoples. Uh, in any case, in Yemen, you could sort that out, but I, I'm not aware that it's been done to any extent. I certainly haven't followed it. But they were there very early. Certainly, they claimed that back in Solomon's time. Whether it goes back that far, the trade relations certainly did. 
and when, where there are trade or rate relations, there are merchants, and where there are merchants, there are people who settle and stay there, become intermediaries, and so it, 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 does, uh, it does develop from there. And the Job stories four or five centuries later show that their presence is in the northern part of the peninsula too. And uh, then after the wars in Palestine, certainly uh, people fleeing Roman occupation must have gone down there, ones who were, uh, who were uh, unable, unwilling, and uh, who were being pursued by Roman forces. Roman forces did not get down that far. Roman forces swept across northern Syria, they swept into Egypt and all these other places, but they didn't get down into these outlying areas. So uh, to my mind, those are the kind of people who brought some of the ideas that I think we see in Islam uh, down there, and uh, in connection with which the Prophet became familiar and took off from that point. Because uh, you get a lot of, um, I work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are found along, on, alongside the Dead Sea. And uh, you get a lot of, for instance, the Yom al-Din that the Prophet speaks about, the Day of Judgment. Well, it's all in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's called Yom HaMishpah, the Day of, the day of uh, Judgment. It's one of the most important Dead Sea Scroll materials. And they say, on the Day of Judgment, God will remove all idolaters off the earth. Well, oh, well that's right, what the Quran is talking about. But this is a document maybe uh, 600 years before the Quran, from the Dead Sea area. And uh, to my mind, uh, those ideas do travel down. Now, again, a believer is not interested in these connections since everything to a believer, whatever the religion is, miraculous. But since we're in academia, and we're not interested so much in miraculous, but in what we can chart as historical and um, intercultural. So um, it's worthwhile pointing these things out. I'll do that as we get into the text, show you what ideas are familiar to me from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The biblical stories that we all know about are familiar from the Bible. Okay, Muhammad has his own version. The angel has given or recited, or he has uh, recited, or you see it, his own version. And it looks as if this has been done from memory and not from an actual text right next to somebody reading it. And we'll be able to see that in the Joseph story. When he recites the Joseph story, he knows basically, probably knows the Joseph story better than most of the people in this class, even religious Christian people in this class who know it the best. Jewish people don't know it so well. Uh, but because they don't read the Bible any more than anyone else knows. Uh, but uh, religious Christians do read the Bible. Uh, and the Joseph story is in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. And the interesting thing is what he acts, what is illustrative of his own character and personality or his own interest. You say, oh, well, he didn't add that. The angel added it. OK, fine. Wherever added it, it is different from the earlier version, which is maybe 2,000 years before. That is undeniable. One version is 2,000 years earlier than the other version. So, uh, I mean, uh, you can say there's no connection, but in fact, one version did antedate the other and was familiar in the area uh, for the previous 2,000 years. So, in fact, uh, it's like saying, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the chicken gave birth to the newer egg. I don't know about the older egg. In any event, um, uh, we know he knows a lot of the Bible stories about Moses, Aaron, and so on and so forth. That, that's pretty straightforward, but his version of them is often uniquely his own. That is, maybe heaven-given, miraculous, maybe uh, the way his memory works on things. I lecture you in, in class. A lot of what I talk about is based on memory. I may, if you were to lecture the same thing I lectured, your memory would be different than mine, and you would spin it differently than I would spin it. This is just the way oral tradition works, the way human beings are when they speak orally, and it isn't right, written down in front of them. When a thing is written down in front of them, what happens? It gets frozen. That becomes the orthodox treatment, particularly when a committee works on it and says, this is the orthodox text, all the others are heretical. And that always comes later, in a later stage, when, uh, when a committee works on something. So, um, so we have um, the... When a text becomes written, you can't really sort of, uh, it doesn't really um, float around so much, move around. In any event, um, so this is the world Muhammad comes into, and there are rabbis there. Now, I was talking about the scrolls and the Dead Sea. 
if you know anything about the Dead Sea, what is the agriculture in the Jericho area, which is at the top of the Dead Sea? No, it's flat. It's in the ravine already. You come down from the hills in the flat. Um, it's Palm Springs. Jericho is a mini Palm Springs. And the Dead Sea is a mini, what's that sea south of Palm Springs? That's, what's it called? Salt Sea. Salt, it's a mini salt in the sea. In other words, what takes us 100, 150 miles, it's all collapsed in the Mediterranean coastline into about 60 miles, 50 miles, actually. You go up from the coast up to some ridge line where Jerusalem is and then down into a rift, which is the deepest rift in the world. 1,500 feet below sea level, and you drop 1,500 feet below sea level precipitously from Jerusalem, you drop down within the space of 20 miles. So Jerusalem is at the top of the ridge, a commanding sort of uh, uh, fortress city, really, that commands both sides of the ridge, the one dropping down to the Dead Sea Rift and the one dropping down to the coastal plain. Uh, but down in the rift is a totally different climate from up on the hills. You can be in Jerusalem, 2,000 feet above sea level. It's not like the mountains here behind uh, um, uh, Pasadena or something, 8,000 feet. It's only 2,000, 2,000 feet or so. Although when you get the difference between the Dead Sea, it's 3,500 feet. Uh, you can be up at 2,000 feet. It can be raining and snowing. You know, it does snow in um, Jerusalem. It can be horrible, cold. The bones can be, you know, like you know, shot through with you know, uncomfortable feeling of uh, being cold and uh, rain sodden. And then you go down in about 25 minutes, you can drive down the hill if no old terrorists are shooting at you and trying to put bullets in your car. Uh, you can drive down the hill and you can be in the Dead Sea Valley Rift and it's temperate. It's almost warm. It's like Palm Springs. And there are uh, tropical things growing there like palm trees. And uh, what they mainly uh, 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 cultivate down in the Dead Sea area and Jericho are dig palm plantations. And uh, uh, that's it, they have fruit stands, just like out in Palm Springs, where they're selling all these exotic fruits down there because of the weird climate. It's way down in this rift, and it's warm. And it doesn't rain much down there, like it does up on the hills. It's so weird. And, um, uh, like you can see out there, I don't know the fruit, but dates and figs and of course oranges of all kinds and grapefruits. But they also have these things called pomelos, which are kind of, a, you have them in Palm Springs now, which are kind of a mixture of an orange and a grapefruit. Uh, they're, they're quite tasty and they're, they're really good. But these are the kinds of things you'll see there. It's just like what you see in the fruit stands out of Palm Springs. And you know, apparently back in the 20s or sometime in the early part of the last century, there was a blight out in Palm Springs, and the palm strings and the palm trees uh, were affected, and many of them died. And when they went to replenish the palm springs out there, they went to the Jericho area and brought the trees, the saplings from Jericho, and replanted them in the palm springs area. And many of the trees, therefore, in the palm springs area, are the same as in the Jericho area and have the same kind of root or origin, uh, particularly the palm trees. Well, the, these areas down in Medina. I thought I wasn't going to get back by hand. Where these uh, people are functioning here, there are these rabbis, and there's a Jewish tribe. But how did a Jewish tribe get down to Medina? Now that, that, that's the question in the 400s. Well, these are date palm plantation areas. These are oases surrounded by date palm plantation. And Medina is a date palm plantation in town. Uh, uh, some of the Arab historians say that the tribesmen, that the Jews there came from Jericho and brought, of course, the cultivating habits with them from Jericho. Um, do I believe that? Yeah, I do believe that. Uh, and I think that, some, uh, that the Dead Sea Scroll people were also uh, habiting this area along the Dead Sea Rift uh, where Jericho is and where all this was going on in this plantation. And I'm sure that in the war against the Romans, the ones who weren't killed or taken prisoner and sold as slaves or crucified fled southwards. And some of them may have gotten down to these oases, and I think they probably did. And they brought with them these skills and knowledge and uh, uh, techniques. Because they weren't, you see, Bedouins. Bedouins are not interested in such things. Bedouins are not date palm plantations. The Arab tribes are not date palm plantations. They're nomadic and they're caravaners. 
but the people who settle in the oases probably had a lot of connection with refugee Jews from the Jericho area, and even in Medina. So there are three Jewish tribes, which means they've been there for quite a long time. All the Arab historians tell you that. And one of the tribes, they say, is actually priestly. Now what does it mean for there to be a priestly Jewish tribe? It's almost, uh, uh, it's almost impossible to understand what that means. Uh, he says that these rabbans, I think, are from the Banu Kuraiza, one of the names of one of the tribes. Uh, the Arab historians and the, and the biographers of the prophet know the names of the three Jewish tribes that are in Medina because they will figure in the history of the prophet and his uh, relations with the people of Medina when he goes there and the difficulties he has, particularly with the Jewish tribes of Medina, as far as he's concerned, because they have more information about the things of which he's speaking than the local people do and they are not um, excited or happy about his claims. It would be like me, with my view, going into the Crystal Cathedral down in, uh, down in uh, what's it called, Crystal Palace, Crystal Cathedral, what's it called? Uh, going down to one of those churches in uh, Costa Mesa, is that Costa Mesa, is it? In Costa Mesa, and say, okay now all you people, you've got it all wrong, listen to me. And they would be involved in their Christmas ceremonies or whatever it is they do, their Easter festivities and things like that. Or even going down to the Maranatha church in Costa Mesa. And I come in there as an outsider from up from the north or east or some other place and saying, listen to me, what kind of reception would I get? Uh, they would just chuck me right out. They would just chuck me right out. I gotta listen to me. That's not always the case with indigenous religious movements. I gotta listen to some newcomer with new ideas that they think they know better than that person. Paul has the same trouble when he goes to Asia Minor and goes into the synagogues. Now in the history of Christianity, the Jews are portrayed very negatively because they don't treat Paul well in these synagogues. If I did what Paul was doing in churches, they would chuck me out so fast, they'd beat me up, they'd do everything to me. I mean, it, 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 you know, he's denying the whole Old Testament. He's denying all of Mosaic law. He's denying all the things these people hold precious. And you think he can walk into the synagogues and get a, a, a friendly uh, reaction when he's contradicting everything that they have in, in their prayer books and so on, and that they're going through their week, weekly routine concerning yet they're portrayed as horrible, as, as a stiff-necked and, and, and uh, mean-spirited, and he's portrayed as shaking the dust off his feet and moving on to the next synagogue. And that's considered good, that he moves on, because the writers are on his side and our pro -quality. You always have to look at the orientation of the people writing this material. Now, I don't say he's good and they're bad or vice versa, but uh, I certainly can understand the other side and that uh, how they would, how they would, uh, how they would act towards a person like that. So the picture of the Jews that has come down through history and this presentation written by people like that is negative. Negative. And that leads to anti-Semitic feelings ultimately uh, blaming this, that, or the other thing on them, and finally holocausts. So to my mind, the literature actually incites hatred, violence, and other things against them for what is actually a totally normal behavior pattern, how they would behave to anyone um, contradicting uh, their, most, uh, their, most, uh, um, their most precious uh, uh, doctrines. And, um, uh, they would, someone would treat me the same if I went into their holy areas. And suppose I went to Mecca and said, okay, now I know the Old Testament as well as you guys know it. I'm going to teach my version of the Old Testament. I think my version is uh, smarter than, than yours, even though you've had it for 2,000 years. Mine's smarter than yours, and I'm going to tell you what uh, really happened. How long do you think I would survive in Mecca? Not even one minute. <laughs> not even a minute, no, not even a minute. Exactly, you got it right. Uh, you see, so, I mean, it depends on who you have. I have this perfect you said it, because that's true. Not even a minute, maybe five seconds. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, people don't look at it like that. They don't see the circumstances of the situation. So it's easy to, I hate to use the word black, and that's not fair to use black as an adjective for negative. People use it, but it's wrong. Uh, but, that's used that way and make them look bad, okay? People make them look bad 
in the way they present them, but they don't look at it from their point of view at all. In other words, you should never take the point of view of anyone's enemies as an accurate description of what that person is. In my last class today that some of you were in, we were talking about the way the Hindus were looked upon by the Muslim conquerors. And they felt that they could just go in and just destroy uh, Hindu temples and uh, eradicate the local religious uh, beliefs because they thought they were all perfect and good and these other people were idolaters and therefore a priori bad. But if you go to southern India and see these lovely Hindu temples and shrines, they're so full of life and color and uh, uh, non-violence and, uh, and uh, friendliness that you wouldn't know why anyone would want to destroy any of them and eradicate them and so on and so forth. So, you know, um, the picture always depends on who is writing the picture. And if I can teach you anything, I hope that you will re re remember that. Let's go back to these rabbis. So there are rabbis. Uh, they do, um, they do um, uh, come from a tribe there. Other texts consider, if you look at the, um, if you look at the um, Muslim texts, consider them from a priestly tribe. Uh, and these rabbis, actually, the reason the story is so interesting, it's from Ibn Hisham, you see, there's a footnote at the bottom. Ibn Hisham is a biographer of the Prophet. So it's from the biographies of the Prophet that were compiled within a century of his, of his death. So these are very old stories. The rabbis, what do the rabbis do in this story? They predict the coming of the Prophet to Asad Kamil, and they also tell Asad Kamil that Mecca is a sacred place. And I think they may even say here that uh, it was founded by our father Abraham. I'm not sure if that's in this story or not. But uh, in any case, um, maybe we should read this so uh, we're familiar with what they say. Now while the Tuba was carrying on war against them, there came to him two Jewish rabbis of the, of the Banu Khorizah, to the bottom of 21. That's the name of the tribe, one of the three Jewish tribes that ultimately Muhammad expelled from Medina. Banu, who bound these sons of. So, uh, they come from the Banu Khorizah. They're in Medina long before any of the other later southern tribes coming up from the breaking of the dike. They probably introduced date palm plantationing there, which was the means of sustenance of that area. And uh, men deep in knowledge, and when they heard that he wished to destroy the city and the people, they, they warned him and advised him, oh king, don't do that. You know, uh, it, it, look, if, uh, if you accept anything between you and the city for what happened, uh, and you go to the lengths you propose, some bad things will happen to you. How come, he said. Because this is the place of refuge of a prophet who in later times will go forth from the sacred territory of the Quraysh. Quraysh are the uh, tribe of the prophet, the custodians of the, uh, of the Kaaba, according to the way these things are portrayed in strict Arab Islamic history. They have the keys to the Kaaba, as it were. So there will come a prophet. So they predict the coming of Muhammad two centuries, a century and a half before. To the Tubas, to this Asad Kamil person. And um, it shall be his abode and his home. So the Jewish rabbis predict the coming of Muhammad. Therefore the king was worried and he stopped what he was going to do, thinking that these two had... Um, pretty good knowledge and he was pleased by what they told him and so he uh, when he left Medina what did he do? He converted to Judaism. So he followed their religion. This is the Muslim source. This is not a story known to Jewish sources at all. It's all from the Muslim source. Do I credit it? Oh, I think there's an element of some uh, reality uh, because we know the religion of the southern Yemen was Judaism at a certain point. We know that. And that may be also the residue of the uh, southern Yemen's, the Jewish population there. Only DNA tests would be able to tell you that. Anyway, he kept on moving south, turned his face towards Mecca, 
because that was the way back home to Yemen, southern Arabia. Then some Houthalites, another tribe of Arabs here, uh, came to him between two of these local places and said, King, King! And they tried to seduce him into going and raiding the Kaaba because they tried to tell him that there's uh, precious treasure there. You following this story here? Uh, you know, there's a place on your way that's full of emeralds and gold, silver, chrysolite, etc. Oh, yeah, he said? Yes, it's the temple in Mecca. And those who belong to it pray there. Now, the Houthalites wished to cause him ill, knowing that destruction awaited him if he violated the precincts of this holy place. Uh, so, on comprehending what they proposed, he, he sent the two rabbis for, who were now with him, traveling with him, obviously, as his teachers, to ask them what they thought about this. And they told him straight, these people only want your destruction and that of your army. We do not know of any other house on earth that God has chosen for himself except this. So they tell him that the Kaaba is God, the Hebrew God, their God, the shrine of which the Jewish God has, uh, has considered its, its place. And that is a very new tradition. Even Jews are not aware of that particular <coughs> tradition. So this is a very interesting as, as implying who's teaching who what here in this uh, background of the 400s. Um, so uh, when you go there, then, uh, don't do what they tell you because you will be you will surely perish if if you do. But rather do as the people there do. Make the circle, the, cir uh, the, the, the circumnambulation that we talked about, the going around of the shrine. So it's an old custom way before Islam. Do the circle that the people do and magnify and honor. And also, as in the Muslim pilgrimage, what we now call the Hajj, which is the Arabic word for pilgrimage, shave your head. Shave your head. Shave your head after you do the, the circle. Uh, are you familiar with the Muslim Hajj enough to know what uh, the person who goes on the Hajj does after he completes what the uh, ritual requirements there are? Well, first of all, you have uh, you have to afford it. Yeah, but what do they do when it's all done? They shave their heads. I'm sorry. They shave their heads. Yes. Yeah, that's the point. They do just what these people they, have they done do in like, pre-Islamic times. I think they do it more than once during the Hajj. Well, at the end of the Hajj, they shave their head to show they've been on the Hajj. When they go back to their communities, everyone knows they're a Hajj by their shaved heads. Now, I don't know about the women. Do the women shave their heads? No, they, no, just, I don't cut, think they, they just cut about like, the, the last They just cut a piece inch, of it. Inch or two inches of their hair. That's good. Thank you for that. But, they should, now, but what I'm trying to illustrate is the custom of shaving the head is connected to this shrine even before the coming of Islam, according to the story. Now, those of you... Thanks for helping. Those of you who know your Christian Jewish Bibles, who shaves their head in Judaism and also then in Christianity as it's portrayed in the Book of Acts? Nazarites. So what's a Nazarite? Well, Jesus is uh, portrayed to some extent as a Nazarite. They don't shave their heads, but when they went through certain festivities in the temple, the temporary Nazarites, after these uh, festivities were concluded, it's all in the book of um, Numbers, I think you'll find it, the laws for the Nazarite, and it's uh, further elaborated in the Talmud, the Jewish uh, uh, books about writing later in the rabbinic period. There is a whole book of the Talmud called the Nazarite, on the subject of Nazarites. It's not exactly Nazarene, that's another word that is not necessarily the same, and scholars argue with that, but I do think it is the same, but in that fact, it, it's a different um, it's a different continent. Uh, there are two Zs in Hebrew. One is a Z and one is a TZ. And uh, one has to do with Netzer, that's a TZ, and that means branch, and we call the branch of David. And that's one of the prophecies in the books of the Isaiah and others about there will come a branch of David uh, and Jesus is considered in Christianity to be the branch of David 
and the other is Nazir, which is a Z, not a TZ, and that has to do with some, someone dedicated to God. I think the later writers have confused all these things, and therefore we get all kinds of things like Nazarenes, Nazarenes, Nazrites, uh, the Church of the Nazarene, Nazareth, uh, there's all kinds of overlapping vocabularies I don't have time to deal with in this class, and I do in the historical of Jesus and classes like that. However, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, those of you who know your Bible well, do you, someone shave his head in that particular presentation? Book of Acts? Who's a Christian here who knows their scripture? No Christian who knows their scripture here? No, you're too embarrassed to tell me. Uh, Paul twice shaves his head. Twice shaves his head. Once, when he's supposed to be on his way to the temple in Jerusalem, but somehow didn't get there, he shaves it at a seaport called Calcare near uh, near present-day Corinth, which is uh, which is um, uh, around chapter 16 of Acts or there, thereby. And the second time he shaves his head is chapter 21, his last visit to Jerusalem before he's mobbed in the temple by the Jews who are portrayed as nasties and blue meanies. Uh, but uh, they mob him in the temple because he doesn't follow the law of Moses, so it's just like someone who would be mobbed in Mecca for the same reason, not following Muhammad's teaching, then they don't think he should be in the temple if he doesn't care about Moses, which is supposed to be a mosaic institution. They try to throw him out. And the Romans save him, in, according to the book of Acts. But the way the book of Acts presents it, the Romans and Paul are all good, and the Jews are all nasty. So but that's because the book of Acts is written by a supporter of Paul, and therefore Paul is presented as an heroic person. However this may be, in his, this last visit, when he goes into the temple, the reason he goes into the temple is because a person who I work on extensively called James, who we now consider to be the so-called brother of Jesus, not the other James, the brother of John. Most people even know Jesus had a brother before I began to work pretty seriously on the subject and popularized him worldwide, uh, and to the extent that actually a uh, um, ossuary popped up not long ago, supposedly with his name on it, forged by people who had read my book. Uh, knew they could make a lot of money off it. But that having been said, James, and this is in historical portions of Acts, Acts changes its narrative around chapter 16. When it goes from a third person narrative, he, they, she said such and such, to a first person narrative, I, we. Most people don't realize that it has shifted its, its, its format around chapter 16. It turns into what we call the we document, which looks like an actual diary of someone, a travel document diary. And that is much more reliable than what, what came before. So this material about Paul's final visit to the temple is in the we document. And there, James tells him, you go into the uh, temple, pay for four people we have under Nazarite oath, pay for the you know expenses of whatever the purification practices are there, and shave your heads thereafter. And the four and Paul are supposed to shave their heads. So this was considered even in back in Palestine, six centuries before, four centuries before, a holy act associated with shrines, visits to shrines, oath that you took in relations to visit to uh, shrines. So the shaving of the head is, a, is, a, is an old Middle Eastern practice relating to shrine activity shrine visitation. And uh, in Islam it's become almost a ritual that is after the Hajj you shave your head. And here these guys are saying, even before Islam, do as the people there do. Circle the Kaaba and uh, where do they say this now? Um, let's see, and uh, I suppose somewhere I should say, uh, and shave your head to show that you visited this shrine. And that's what Muslims still do. And that's what Paul is pictured as having done in Jewish Christianity with uh, James' instructions in the temple and so on. And that's what the Nazarites did in ancient times to show their dedication to God after they finished their Nazarite oath, period. So all these things are connected. Uh, you could write a paper on this. How you would put it all together, that would be something else. And humble yourself uh, and then go forth. But to look, to, as that says, oh, wh wh why don't you do this? Yourselves, all they say. And here it is, you see. They say, it is the temple of our father Abraham. So they are the ones who tell the, 
Qutubas, who then, from whom the Muslims then inherit this, that the Kaaba is Abraham's shrine. And this is what the Prophet then says in the various surahs of the Quran where, where he referred to this, particularly Surah 2, the longest surah of the Quran, where many of these things are set forth, uh, the surah of the cow, where he will talk about Abraham and how he erected the Kaaba and so on and so forth. Basically, we already have it here from that the rabbis are claiming, whether it's an accurate story or not, that Abraham set down this shrine. Is that in any Jewish scripture? No, no, none that I know of. And it's not in rabbinic literature. These are Muslim stories about the Kaaba. And uh, do I think there's some truth to this? Uh, yeah, I think probably these refugees down in these areas did circulate stories like that. But at this time, was the Kaaba a monotheistic shrine? No, it was considered a pagan shrine. There were other deities in the Kaaba. And uh, the moon deity, uh, Manat, Aruza, and Alat, I think they're called, and there's some references to them in this. Uh, there was, we're supposed to have a history book associated with this class. Did that ever come in, um, the Hitti book? Uh, I think it was, or, or rather the, the Bernard Lewis book, The Arabs and History. It, it, is that in there? Well, he should have a first chapter or two on this subject. You should read that in conjunction with what we are reading. How many got that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Lewis book? Yeah, do you have it with you, anybody? Can you give me the names of the chapters there? Do you have it? Yeah, uh, give me the name of the first two chapters in that book. Uh, and if you can't get it at the bookstore, because they only had a limited number, you can get it from Amazon.com online, just as cheap or, or um, cheaper. Yeah, this is called The Arabs in History. It's a good little short thing. It's nothing fantastic, but it's quick. Here, well, he's doing what we're doing. Arabia before Islam. That's the first chapter, and that's what we're doing here. You can follow along. Second, Muhammad and the rise of Islam. That's what we're getting into now. So basically, you should read those two chapters for another view of this. And I'm sure that he'll tell you something about these things. Thanks a lot. This is the book in your version. I'm sure there are lots of different versions. Uh, who published that? Does it say on the back of it? What's the book? Oxford. Yeah, well, there's many different versions of it, and uh, they're all books. Huh? Oxford University. Yeah. There are many different, and, and they'll be online, and if you can't get it in the bookstore, only could order about 20 some odd copies. That's all that were left. And I said, order them. I don't know if they're sold out down there or not, but in any case, it's called, it should, should be on your handout, your reading list, Bernard Lewis. You see him on television at the moment. He's an old man. He keeps at Princeton. He's in sort of America. So they're always having him as an expert on the Middle East nowadays, talking about the situation in the Iraq, and they have them on these pundit shows like O'Reilly or Charlie Rose. Charlie Rose uh, loves him. He always has him on there and do hold forth about the situation in the Middle East. And it's what's called the Arabs in history? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. Arabs in history. And it doesn't matter who the publisher is. Or any similar one would be fine. There's a book by Philip Pitti, Short History of the Arabs. That's good too. Uh, any history book would be fine uh, that covers subjects this kind. I can't really make uh, uh, two different uh, of them. Okay. So um, they say our father Abraham made this shrine. Now there's nothing in the Old Testament about that, but is there stories about Abraham and Ishmael that have to do with interesting events that could be connected up to events such as this in the book of Genesis? How many have read the book of Genesis and can tell, tell us? The book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible. I, I, I recommend you read it sometime. It's really interesting. Well, what happens is uh, in the Bible stories, I had a few of um, my Muslim friends in the class in the old days, and uh, he, uh, they went on to take an Old Testament class. And, 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 and one friend of mine particularly from, he came from um, um, Jiddah, and he was really a, a very sweet fellow. And uh, he didn't like the Old Testament stories. He kept saying, oh, these are lies, these are lies. I understand where he was coming from. The reason he thought they were all lies, first of all, Muhammad in the Quran says that Jews and Christians lie and have introduced lots of lying into their scripture. So that is also uh, something that is a familiar thing even in the Quran. But what he, he didn't like the nasty stories that were in the Old Testament. These people are not portrayed as saints in the Old Testament. They're portrayed as... Uh, 
you know, human people with lots of warts and uh, and failings and uh, you know, human um, uh, weaknesses. And um, that upset him because his version of view of these people was all very exalted. So, for instance, in the story about Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael, where Ishmael is the firstborn through Hagar, the so-called slave or concubine woman. Hagar is an Egyptian. And in the story, which is very different sources for the story in the Genesis presentation, Abraham, uh, Sarah is barren and can't bear. And most of the women in Genesis are not able to bear children until an angel comes and helps them. And that's really, I think, a symbolic thing to show that God's choice is in the final decision to open up the wounds of these women to give birth to these wonderful people. Uh, but in any case, the storyteller has to portray them, therefore, as having a hard time and not being able to conceive right, right away. Sarah is portrayed like that, and uh, later on, uh, so is um, Rachel, uh, Jacob's favorite wife. Uh, she can't bear children, so meanwhile, her sister's getting all the children, and then she gets jealous and slips some handmaids into uh, Ish Isaac's bed, and so on and so forth, and, and they start bearing, and so on. Well, my friend from Jitta, he thought these stories were terrible. They were just, for him, totally um, disreputable and uh, disgusting stories about the patriarchs. And that is true, they would seem that way to someone who didn't like the humanity of these stories and the colorfulness of these stories. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I can understand where he was coming from. Anyway, so this story is that finally, it was um, when uh, finally, uh, Sarah allows her handmaiden to go into Abraham's bed, Agar, and she gives birth to Ishmael. That's the first of uh, Abraham's sons, and then he becomes the father of a great nation, 12 tribes, and so on, and his whole genealogy is given in the Old Testament. And it's clear that he, as I told you, comes from around Midian or Sinai, his, uh, his, um, his descendants. And then finally, when Sarah's 99, according to the Bible, and I don't think anyone ever bore children at 99, but anyway, God, the angels come and tell her she's going to have a child, and she laughs, and so therefore the child is called laughter. It's up. He laughed. So the, uh, um, uh, the angel says to her, you laughed. She says, no, why, why did you laugh? It's not funny. God can do anything. In any case, Isaac is born with the name laughter. The storyteller trying to explain his name. He laughed. So one is Abraham laughs, the other is Sarah laughs. They're different versions of the story. What is not in question is in the storytelling, uh, Isaac is pictured as playing with Ishmael. Ishmael is much older. And uh, Sarah is jealous. She doesn't like the fact that the two are playing together. And like many um, wives that have felt neglected or uh, cast aside or, or whatever, she goes and complains to Abraham and says, look Abraham, I don't want that son of the slave or the handmaiden playing with my son Isaac. You get rid of them both. And of course, uh, you know, uh, a Muslim or someone who loves Isaac, uh, who loves Ishmael and so on, wouldn't like these stories. They're not told because they're anti-Islamic. They're just told because they're early stories about the weaknesses and foibles of the patriarch. So what happens? Abraham doesn't want to do anything. He's very weak, but he finally gives in to the pestering of his uh, official wife. And he goes and tells Hagar she has to go and take Ishmael with her. And so she cries and weeps and she goes out into the wilderness someplace. And what happens to her? An angel appears to her at a well, at a well, and says, "You, he will be the father of great nations too, and so on and so forth. Do not fear. And so the, the, the storyteller is not sympathetic to Sarah. Actually, the storyteller is sympathetic to Ishmael and his plight, and Hagar. See, the storyteller is not presenting the patriarchs as great heroes. They're just chosen in the chosen line, but they have all the weaknesses of normal human beings. And they're not favored, because the presentation of uh, Abraham there is like a weak-willed dodo. And uh, Sarah is a nasty piece of work, you know, and so on and so forth. So they're not trying to show these people as perfect people. Well, my, as I said, my Islamic student didn't like these uh, stories, and I can well understand why he felt that way. But the Bible is like that. That's what Genesis, that's what people have loved about the Bible. It's very human, very earthy, uh, full of uh, <laughs> the real stuff of uh, everyday life.
people can identify with it, good or bad. So in any case, there is a well there. Now, the well, and that's why I'm talking about all this. This well is given a name. I think it's called Lahai Wa in the book of Genesis. So someone could have actually said, actually, that well is not near Beersheba, which is in southern Palestine, where it's presented as being. That well is down in the Arabian Desert. Um, I guess it's a, uh, almost a thousand miles further south down where Mecca is, and that's the well of Zamzam, and that's where God chose Ishmael and told him that he would be the father of a great nation. Someone could have transported the whole story a thousand miles south of Israel. And I personally think that's what happened. That's what I think happened. When these people said, this is Ishmael's, Abraham and Ishmael founded this shrine. There's no evidence Abraham and Ishmael ever were down there. But in the storyteller's mind, all things are, are uh, possible. And since these stories are quite fantastic anyway, why not add a few other new versions to them? Oral history works like that. And those are the stories that go into the Quran to some extent, I, I honestly believe. In any event, here's a reflection of it. By this time, the rabbis are saying, that's Abraham's shrine, the shrine in, in Mecca, even though it's now a pagan shrine. That's Abraham. Now, I don't know if this is a true story or it isn't a true story. But we're in here 400 AD, and that's already the picture that we are getting here, whether the Muslims are putting it back into their mouth or whether that's what they really thought, I don't know. But I have a feeling that's what they were saying to people. We are debarred going into it because of the idols that are inside it. And the blood offerings made uh, beside it, because these people are horrible, uh, you know, uh, idolaters, polytheists, or words to that extent. That's why the rabbis say he can go in, but they can't go in. Because the shrine is Abraham's shrine, but they can't enter it because it's become a, 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 a polytheist idolatry shrine. Ultimately, Muhammad purifies the Kaaba, doesn't he? As part of his mission. So this builds right on top of this. Anyway, the king was not happy about uh, what he'd heard from the Hudhalites, and he had their hands and feet cut off. <laughs> I'm not laughing, it's a pretty nasty punishment. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, widespread in those days, but there you are. And then he continued on his way to Mecca. He made the circumambulation of the shrine, sacrificed some camels and so on, and just as the modern pilgrims might do, and shaved his head as the pilgrims did. So the pilgrims were already doing this before Islam, and he does it too. And he stayed there six days, like the, probably the later uh, Hajjahs were more or less that he was doing, and he, he feasted the inhabitants with camels and, you know, made everybody pretty uh, happy. Some break here in the text and then some more stories. Then there's a story about him getting, moving on to Yemen further, southern Arabia, and there he makes his subjects adopt his religion himself. So he makes the people of Yemen convert to Judaism. So this is the story of the Muslims of how Judaism got to southern Arabia. You can take it or leave it, that's whatever you want. The final part of this story is a, is a um, ordeal of fire, where the rabbis compete with some of the local priests or uh, sorcerers or whatever, and uh, prove that Judaism is the correct religion, and the people uh, do adopt it. Where is that test by fire taken from in the scripture? You know your scripture. You know your scripture. Where is the test by fire taken from in the scripture? Test by fire is it Exodus? No, you know your scripture. Daniel. Daniel. Daniel has to go. Shadrach, Abdab, Waterson, and Abednego have to go in the fire and prove that they can survive the fire, and that God has chosen them against the Persians, sort of. Yeah, that's it. You got it. You know it. You see, it's going to get your memory talking. Eshak, Shadrach, and Abednego. It's in the spiritual, I think. So, yeah, that, so, yeah, it's there. And that's basically what this story is uh, is, is based on. This, uh, but there may have been another test like that. Okay, so that's the end of Assad's life. Basically, he adopts Judaism and brings Judaism to southern <laughs> Arabia, uh, Yemen, uh, and so on. And, uh, well, we've got some more stories here that continue. And finally, this is the Tuba dynasty, it goes on for another century, page 26, about the last Tuba dynasty. 
When Amr the Tuba dynasty comes to an end, with Amr the Tuba dynasty comes to an end, the succeeding kings were elected by eight of the most powerful barons. By the way, this may be how Judaism also got into uh, Ethiopia, because there are Jews in Ethiopia. They're called Falasha. And in fact, the Israeli legislature just passed a law to bring the last of the 8,000 Falashas to Israel. The reason that, that they brought a lot previously, but the reason they're bringing the last of them, because these were considered to be mixed, uh, mixed Christian and Jewish uh, blood um, groups, and uh, they all want to leave, and they want to come to Israel, but the Israelis were worried about, um, about that situation of who they really were. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of um, um, falashas were probably comes from Palestinian falasha Palas, Palas, probably comes from that. A lot of them came earlier, and I, I met lots of them when I was on my archaeological expedition recently there. And most of them are really tremendous citizens. They're in the army. Um, they're in the police force. They're mostly do security work. Every place I went, there was an Ethiopian guard with a machine gun, and. I, he was quite frightening. I mean, I'll tell you, I, you want to mess with him. You, you, so they had, the, uh, they had the security services, the private security services, wrapped up as their own private profession. The way I, if you've been up in the Los Angeles airport, you'll see that many of these folks have the, uh, the toll takers at the toll booths uh, profession wrapped up. And I don't know if you've noticed, but when you go to the toll booth, many of the people there are from Ethiopia, Somalia, someplace like that, and they have almost a a lock on the market of the toll taking up in the Los Angeles area. Well, in Israel, all over Israel, all the guards, security guards, all around the buildings, every place you go with machine guns, this kind of thing, are usually Ethiopian Jews. Uh, that seems to be one of their favorite uh, professions. So uh, they came, but uh, uh, the point is that this Judaism from Southern Arabia probably got over somehow into Ethiopia. How it got there is only uh, mythological stories can tell, but there are still people there now, thousands of years later, who are claiming this descent and who want to go back to what they consider their homeland. Whether it's a homeland or not, DNA would tell. On the other hand, they consider it a safer place, even with all the terrorism to be, than where they are at the moment, which is uh, obviously a pretty difficult circumstance according to them. Now, quickly. So, uh, during the period, the Abyssinians conquered some part of the country, that is the Ethiopians. Abyssinia is the Greek word for Ethiopia. I'm going to keep it to the border of. And Christian viceroys were sent uh, to govern the area. So the area slowly became Christianized. Because Ethiopia had been Christianized by this point by the Byzantines, uh, who were in uh, Constantinople. The last tuba was Dhunuaz. He was a descendant of Asad Khan. So this is the last tuba. He's called Lu Nuas. You'll find his name there on page 26. If you have your book, which you should probably try to have, or Xerox off someone else if you want to uh, save yourself the money and uh, that person's willing to let you uh, be a scringer. Uh, you know, when they paid the money and you didn't, uh, so it's up to you. You know, if you can get them to let you Xerox their book, I wouldn't let you do it for mine since I had to pay all that money out. But, uh, it's up to you, it's up to your relation with your friends. Uh, so he was the last one. He crushed the barons and made himself the monarch of Yemen in an unquestionable manner. He was a fanatical adherent of Judaism. Oh, there you go. There's no way you can get around that. And he wanted, he didn't like the penetration of Christianity now into southern Arabia through the Ethiopian connection. And where the Christi Ethiopians had also been Christianized at some point in the third or fourth century AD. And the Himyarites flocked, that is the natives were called Himyarites, flocked to his standard and out of uh, as much for religious reasons as for hatred of the Ethiopians, Abyssinians. And the, the murder of two, children, two Jewish children gave Dhunuwath the cause to march into the capital of Christianity in southern Arabia, a town called Najran. So there was supposedly some sort of uh, intercommunal strife and murder and so on, a place in southern Arabia called Najran. I think it still exists to this day. And it was considered a Christian town because of Ethiopian penetration. And uh, it made the inhabitants, he gave them like Muhammad will later do with Islam, Judaism or death, Islam or the sword. So he already has started that tradition here before even the coming of the prophet. 
Many perished by the sword, the rest were thrown into a trench, the king ordered it dug and uh, burning fire there. And a hundred years later, when Muhammad was being sorely persecuted, he encourages his followers by the example of the Christians of Madron, who he claims, and there's a quote here from the Quran, Surah 85, I'm not sure, for no reason, but they believed in the mighty, glorious God they were persecuted. Dunuaz paid dearly, however, for his triumph. Another of these Ethiopian um, uh, allies fled the city, went to Byzantium, and implored the, uh, the, uh, the uh, emperor Justinius there, a famous uh, 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 Byzantine emperor, to write a letter telling the leader of Ethiopia, someone called Najasi, to take action. This is really important. And then 70,000 strong, therefore, came across the Red Sea and embarked, disembarked at Yemen. Dunuaz, however, couldn't count on the loyalty of his Himyarite nobles, and his troops deserted him in the face of this strong Ethiopian threat. And uh, the, uh, the quotation from uh, Tabari, the historian, is, when he saw the fate that had befallen himself and his people, he turned to the sea, setting his spurs to the horse, rode from the shallows until he reached the deep waves. Then he plunged into the waves, and nothing more was ever seen of him again. So basically, in the Zealot style of uh, Palestine, like Mossad and other way, he commits suicide rather than surrender. He rides his horses into the sea. Whether this is a, a real story, I don't know. In any case, what is this leading up to? We get the Ethiopian invasion. This is around 500-something now, maybe about 530, maybe uh, 60, 70 years before the, uh, the prophet. Anyway, the, the, the Abyssinian general takes vengeance now on the other side, slaying a third of the women and children and giving, selling the rest as slaves. He reduced the Yemenites to submission, reestablished order, and so on. So all that is given to you on page 28, and you can read all of that. And finally, the conclusion is, this disastrous failure, failure which took place, okay, wait, 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 uh, I'm wrong. This narrative here, then, is the story of Abraha. Abraha is someone referred to in the Quran. Abraha, as time goes on in southern Arabia, becomes the Ethiopian governor of southern Arabia. Clearly, his name was originally Abraham. And he's called in these stories Abraha, which is just Abraham with, a, with one consonant missing. And it tells how he finally wants to subdue all of southern Arabia. Arabia, and he has the elephants helping him in his army, and he sends his troops north, and they get as far north as Mecca, the birthplace of the prophet, and there the, uh, the Ethiopians lay siege to Mecca, and the elephants appear at Mecca, and this is referred to in the Quran in the Surah of the Elephant. There is a surah at the end of the Quran called the Surah of the Elephant. And this is referring to the Ethiopians. So the coming of the Ethiopians with their elephants into southern Arabia in the wake of the Jewish kingdom there, crushing the Jewish kingdom, trying to conquer the rest of uh, southern Arabia, sets the stage for the birth of the prophet. The reason? All Muslim historians date the birth of the prophet at the time of the appearance of the Ethiopian elephants at Mecca. So in the, uh, in the aftermath of all this trouble in the south, Judaism penetration, Christian penetration, Ethiopian armies coming. Uh, we get this uh, appearance of the Ethiopian uh, elephants at Mecca, and it is that to that year and that appearance that the um, that the uh, um, birth of the prophet is dated. Now, weirdly here, I notice chapter page 30 and 31 are missing. Uh, which is just the next chapter, so it really doesn't and uh, doesn't impinge on us. And I'm not sure. I don't know if your page 30 and 31 are missing, but uh, uh, I'll see if I can get that and uh, make a note of it. But uh, they should uh, they should make good of that uh, that lack of it. In any event, um, make a note if you see any other pages listed missing, and I'll take it down and make the Xerox view the substitution pages. But next time, bring your corn. Next time, we will talk about the prophet's birth. We will talk about his first uh, revelation. We will talk about the beginning of his life. In your Quran, we're finished with this at the moment.